everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, on behalf of the Jefferson Educational Society, I'd like to welcome you all to the Quarry Higher Education Council. My name is Abby Hancox, and I'm an intern with the Jefferson. The Jefferson Educational Society has at least one program each month here at the Quarry Higher Ed, and we're gearing up for our summer programming. Uh, our summer schedule will be released in the upcoming weeks, so be sure to keep an eye out. We also have some more upcoming satellite programs. On Thursday, May 25th, Dr. Adrian Dixon will give a lecture about overcoming the obstacles for mental health treatment in the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color community. This program will be held at the Erie Center for Arts and Technology in Erie. Uh, please be sure to visit our website for more information on Jefferson Lectures. The Jefferson currently offers lectures here in Quarry on State Street in Erie at our home location, digital programs, the Erie Center for Arts and Technology on the east side of Erie, Fairview, Edinburgh, and now in Harbor Creek. So plenty of satellite locations to choose from. Tonight, we will learn about reimagining farming in Northwest PA from Julie Zajac. Mm. Julie Zajac grew up on the farm that provides the base of operation for Three Pillar Z Farm, 3PF, um, located in Columbus, PA. Julie, if I mispronounce that, please correct me. Yeah, no worries. I'm good. The values of hard work, perseverance, and lifelong learning coupled with the experiences of her 30 plus year career in healthcare and public health underpin 3PF's three-pronged mission of cultivating the next generation of farmers, reconnecting people to their food sources, and enhancing the quality of life in Northwestern PA. Julie knows the value of farming and agriculture as a way of life and wants to share the family farm to help new farmers realize their goals for themselves and their families. She aims to use her expertise in policy, partnerships, and program evaluation to, go, to grow 3PF into an organization that will strengthen the resilience of Northwest Pennsylvania's food system. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Julie Zajac. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Abby, I appreciate that. So um, there are several folks here that know me, um, and there may be some people that know me that I've may not recognize uh, after, geez, I left here in 88 after graduating from Mercyhurst, so it's been a little bit. But with, you know, my parents getting older and uh, the passing of my eldest brother, John, we found ourselves, my sister Diane and I, who is, never gets the credit she deserves <laughs> for holding the fort down um, at our family farm. So, uh, the idea is that we would share the farm and turn it into a community asset uh, rather than giving up and selling, you know, to the powers that be, the prevailing wind. So um, I hope to bring what I've learned over my lifetime to the farm and benefit the local area, but also bring uh, people from other areas to here because there's a lot of great things happening here. It takes leaving and coming back to really see that. So I hope you all are proud of where you live because I miss it uh, after all these years. So we did a little test run. I'd like to try to do some interactive um, couple questions for you. So we, we did this with some folks. So for those of you who wish to and you have cell phones, what I'd like you to do is answer give a couple of words in terms of how you describe the current state of farming in Pennsylvania. So if you text my name, Julie Zajac, 090 222333, and let's see if I can work my magic and get the actual screen up so we can see this. Bear with me, flipping over. Okay, so we're gonna present this. Now, I think for some of you, we got cows, <laughs> corn, sustenance, potatoes, sunshine. Anyone else want to add? Mm, perseverance, all right. Soybeans. They plant a lot of soybeans around here. Soybeans. 
Anyone else, if you don't want to do the text thing, you certainly can shout it out. All right. Diverse, okay. I like that. Diverse in crops. Yeah, we used to be uh, lots of potatoes around. Remember oats, but more so now soy and corn. A um, lot of animals, more and more beef cows. Less dairy, unfortunately. Okay, all right, now let me escape out of this. I've got it, another one for you. Okay, we're gonna go to the next question. All right, so for this one, it's a survey. All right, so we're gonna activate this and we're gonna present it. Okay, so this is a little bit more difficult. Let me just, uh, instead of having you go to your um, browser, this one you would go to pollev.com on your browser, Safari, Google, whatever, and your phone, and then backslash Julie Zajac 090 how important is it for youth to have farm experiences? And there's three options. Very important, somewhat important, or not important at all. So for those of you who don't want to do the cell phone thing, that's fine. What do you guys think about youth and farming? It's very important, extremely important. I see some nodding. Okay. All right, anyone brave enough to get in there and actually do the <laughs> I just submitted. Okay. All right, well, my words aren't coming up, but basically I think we've got a couple of uh, very I don't know why it's not popping up on that side. But I think the consensus in the room is it's very important for youth to have farm experiences. Okay. Well, thanks for for indulging me on this. I was hoping to have a little bit of fun doing some interactive uh, engagement with you. Okay. All right. So we'll start presenting this. Are we back? Okay. Here we go. Okay. So a couple disclaimers and in, in the scope of presentation. Uh, anyone here a farmer? No farmers in the room. Anyone ever, are you, anyone in the agriculture realm sector? Okay, well, if you know anything about agriculture or familiar with it at all, you know it's really, there's so many areas here. There's uh, so much to dig into. This presentation is my experience in researching things as well as my time on the farm and as I've come back and thought about how are we going to keep this farm and use it for the greater good of the area. So it, I really want to focus on the human resource piece because if you don't have someone tending the land or raising the animals, you don't really have a farm. You have land, but no one's shepherding it. So a reminder about the importance of agriculture in Pennsylvania. It's a large sector. I mean, you're, you're looking at uh, in that middle total output, $132.5 billion related to agriculture, and they cast a broad net. Not just farming, things related to farming, the whole food processing sector is considered in agriculture. So that's those direct and indirect um, in, uh, economic aspects. The total labor income, $32.8 billion, so that's pretty massive for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania used to be, I, th I think it's fallen a few down the list, it used to be in the top 10 for um, agriculture, but it's, uh, it's fallen down maybe 11 or 12 uh, behind California and Texas. The, those are the, the two biggest for agriculture. I was, I thought perhaps it would be interesting to see what the what crops are um, livestock as well as crops are um, 
the most you know productive here. And surprisingly, dairy, which I'm shocked at because we were a dairy farm and my brother stopped farming in the late 2000s and as we've worked with local farmers, dairy has dried up in this area. But it's definitely going gangbusters, well I shouldn't say gangbusters, it's doing well in southern PA and eastern PA where the larger dairies are. Uh, but you see chicken, cattle and calves, there's a large um, cow-calf pear industry, a lot of calving. Anybody surprised to see mushrooms? I think PA is the number one state for mushrooms. So, and then it continues with chickens and then down the list, corn, hogs. I was surprised to see, another thing is there's so much data related to agriculture. USDA is a very data rich organization. And so you may look at something here and then look at it in another place and things are slightly different. So um, there's, there's a lot to parse through, but uh, I was glad to see floricultures up and coming, 194 million. So this is what we have going on in the state of Pennsylvania, but in terms of what's happening in Northwest Pennsylvania, you know, from my observation, there's a, definitely a decline in what's happening. Although there's some, certainly some good things happening um, that, that are popping up. So obviously with the rural exodus, I mean, this map shows, this is comparing 2010 to 2020. We know it's been going on for much longer than that but a decade of population change. So look where the red is. Round, you know, you see high, higher density red around the Great Lakes region, western Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is losing population year after year. If you look at our counties, which it, when I see the census come out, I always look at our, our Warren, Erie, Crawford County, and we, we're constantly losing population. And they're going to the southern and western regions. So we're losing people. Uh, the population changed from 1900 to 2010. You've got Philadelphia exploding, that southeastern PA region down below. We're the northern tier up here, and we're pretty stagnant. There might have been a little bit of growth in the 70 to 80, but, but declining again in 2010. So I also looked at the different cities. Can't, I did not find the county population, but I've got the city population. And Erie's far left, Meadville's in the center, Warren population on the right. And there are more, stat, the stat, statistics go back farther for Erie. So you'll see a population explosion up until about 1960, and then it starts dropping off from there. And then for Meadville and Warren, uh, they only had it as far back as 1990. But you'll see Meadville, about a half a percentage point, um, roughly changing over the uh, past 40 years, roughly? No, 30 plus years, 30 years. And then Warren County, about that, closer to one percentage point loss. And we're looking at, you know, for Meadville, 15,000 people. Warren, hey Adam. Uh, 11,000 people in declining. So this doesn't bode well for getting new blood to, to encourage people to go into farming. Okay, so the definition of a farmer, you look in the dictionary, person who owns or manages a farm, person who's engaged in agriculture, raising living organisms for food or raw materials. Um, then we've got more regulatory defined um, farming. So we've got from the Cornell Law School, uh, and then also that uh, more, uh, the final definition that's uh, all inclusive. And one of the things, I think it's in the 1990s, the definition of agriculture expanded to include other types of industries. So not strictly farming, dairy, or crops, but uh, forestry and the food production, et cetera. In my mind, and I'm uh, as you'll see, a farmer's in, in other places, a farmer is a steward of the land and the plants and animals that the land supports. So this is a, a very big responsibility, and it's not easy. And uh, do, uh, does anyone in here come from a farming family? 
Okay, so you know how much time and effort. I mean, one of the reasons, you know, our eldest brother ran the farm for years, but he was a one-man show and he did not have a family. Uh, the rest of us went off and did what we did. Um, went on to, you know, various careers and et cetera. Um, but you really need, you know, we're losing one to two, gener we've lost one to two generations of farmers. And so you really need that support because it's hard work, it's 24-7. It's like the military. You don't get a break. If something happens overnight, you're out there and taking care of it. You know, I remember a long time ago when we had, uh, you know, cows down in the field or something happened and you have out there, or of course, the birthing thing, cows having a calf, you've got to be out there to, to make sure the calf is, um, comes out easily and everything's A-OK -okay with that calf. So for farming, you know, as I've gone through my career, it, it takes, again, leaving and, and looking back. So uh, I always tell people I've never been the sharpest tool in the shed, but I've always been a hard worker. I always could figure something out. Um, I didn't quit. And so that has served me very well in my career in health. And, um, and you know, we would do these personality work things and uh, I would get the unconventional. <laughs> so I'm the unconventional thinker, having to think differently. So, you know, I, I, in my career, I have met people who've, been, who've grown up on farms or their grandparents had farms, but not a lot of them. So the farmer has to really be that 360 degree person that can do it all. You're problem solving, you've got to make sure your time management is good because you've got a million things going on. You've got to have the stamina. And does anybody know the average age of a farmer these days? 57, and I'm about to turn 57, and I know I could not do it. I could not do it full time. Uh, I've, there's a statistic, I should know this off the top of my head, but it, it's, we have a low percentage of farmers that are uh, age 35 or younger. So we've got an issue about what's gonna happen, uh, in the, especially in this area. And I hope that we can, you know, raising awareness will help turn it around. Um, it's, it won't be easy, but if people are aware and we kind of come together and make things happen to support new farmers. We can turn it around. There are other places doing this, but mm, yeah, yeah. You'll see that statistic, the 2017 um, ag census. It's all over. It's all over the place. So in Pennsylvania, in terms of farm trends. Uh, and so I'm pulling from what I could find that was already, I mean, again, that USDA data is very, very dense. So there were, happened to be a 2013 um, set of slides that I pulled from and I added some data points to it. But thinking about the early 1900s all the way to today, to, today, to 2020, we've had a 76% decline in the number of farms. And yes, that makes sense, okay? Subsistence farming, that's what our grandparents, my grandfather Alex and his wife Lillian did when they came here in 1929. They bought the um, farm that we currently have, some of that property still, in 1929, right before the Great Depression hit. So thank heavens they did that because they had their food set. Um, they did not hurt like other people hurt in that era. But in, as I mentioned before, in 1993, uh, the definition of farming uh, changed to include other types of industry. So you'll see a little bit of bump in the number of farms, but we've pretty much remained stagnant. So just over 50, 53,000 farms in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, which is down from 220,000 at the beginning of the century of 1900s. In terms of acreage, and this is what a lot of people are concerned about too, is the fact that more and more farmland is going into development. And so um, we've had a 50% decline over the past 70 years. And I wanna say, yeah, it's a, I think it's like 7.7 7 million acres that are still in farming 
down from 14, over 14 million in 1950. So, you know, again, with the Philadelphia area, Pittsburgh area, you're going to you probably see more of that acreage that's going into development. But looking at our counties that I, I am defining Northwest Pennsylvania as Erie, Crawford, and Warren, um, in Erie County, you've got an 18 percentage, or 18 percent reduction um, in the number of farms uh, since 2012, and then also in Crawford County, 19 percent reduction, and then in Warren County, which is where our farm is, which I'm, I guess I can understand, but I am alarmed to see it's 25 percent reduction. And look at the average number, average farm size. You know, we're we're not even into the two. 200s. So you don't have, we don't have many farms that are in that large, you know, what's considered large as 2,000 acres. We have a lot of smaller farms in this area, so we have to think about what that farm size means. I didn't get in their, their specific data sheets for each county that talks about what they produce. What I see more for Warren County is animal livestock, and that's probably because Warren County is less open land and more hills. For our farm, we're in Pine Valley, so we have, um, we have more side hill, you know, pasture hill land, over probably 50 acres of pasture land on the hillside. We, we're not gonna turn that into crop land. That's where we're gonna uh, feed livestock, have them graze on the pasture hillside. What happened, uh, or a recent tool that the Department of Agriculture uh, commissioned is, uh, which I think is wonderful, is workforce trends. So you can see, and I've got these by county, the number of people working in agriculture. On the left, which is the, has the blue, you're looking at total operator plus hired help. And so for Erie, going from I don't have my glasses on here. What about 1900 down to 1466? Um, and that's from 2001 to 2020. And then in, t in terms of proprietor employment, so that's the owner. So 1500, we got a little bit of a bump up in the late 2000s and then down again toward 2020. For Crawford County, similar picture, looks like about 1800 in 2001 down to about 1400 for farm employment and then on the proprietor side you're looking at 1500 and then probably down to about 1200 um, for the farm owner warren county uh, even less so we have a I, i'm not quite sure what happened between 2001 and 2008 but there was a spike there and then coming back down again um, over the course of the past roughly, what, 12 years? So, you know, especially for us, the reason that I'm so passionate about this is it, it hit home and it hit hard. Um, and you don't realize what you're missing till you lose it. And so this is the awareness that I hope we can raise in this area. Um, farmer suicide, uh, it is a, it's a, it, it really, the awareness, really the research around it kind of peaked in that 2018, 2019 time frame right before the pandemic. And that's where, like for us, what I was aware of is, okay, dairy was going uh, going bye-bye. The, the young man that was renting from us, he had to sell his cows, et cetera. And so, you know, uh, and, I, and what I understand that was happening at that time was a consolidation. Walmart uh, started their own dairy in Indiana. And so Dean's Dairy that had been selling to Walmart, this, is, this tells you the, the power that Walmart has in terms of um, the purchasing and distribution power. But when they built their uh, production facility in Indiana, Dean's Dairy went out of business. So I think it was finalized in, from what I read in 2019. Well, that really killed the dairy industry, especially here in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania. Again, anecdotal from what I from what I understand. So that really threw people for a loop. And I cannot find the statistics on the number of suicides. It's kind of hard to poll farmers. Farmers are pretty private, 
and their families, and so what you'll see is anecdotal information. Um, farm Bureau Okay, thank you, thank you. They're on my list, but I never, I, I do not get to them. I did try to get to Warren County. Um, but the economic base, again, I would love for someone to do the research of with family farms. Obviously, we know that from a farm, you've got all these different sectors that the farm depends upon. Uh, whether it's mechanical, you're getting your feed and supplies, doing business in town with bankers, attorneys, et cetera. You're hopefully selling to your product to local restaurants, et cetera. But, you know, I have read, although I have not seen the, the data, if there is data, I did not find it, on what it means to those local economies. And when a, what I've read is when farms go away, so do the people, the, the businesses that support them. And what we hear very often, I, you know, I say it about my own child, but the disconnect from, from food. Where does your food come from? And, and again, with the, I have, again, the corporatization of, of agriculture, you don't know what your food goes through. So my goal here is as we raise awareness, I hope that we can get more people connected to land to do the farming, we can create a network, um, a coordinated and collaborative network where we're actually resilient in this area. We know where our food comes from, we buy locally, and the food is actually healthier than what you would get that's coming from overseas or you know far away. Um, when I started coming back, I went to the Corey High School and you know learned because I wanted to maybe connect the students with doing something on the farm. Well, there's no Future Farmers of America anymore. Um, I, they were not hosting a 4-H club, although I know that Warren County has a very strong 4-H group, thanks to Maggie Curtis. Um, and I'm not sure who else is working with them, but um, I was pleased to see that when I went to the Warren County Fair last year. Um, but. It, what I learned about Future Farmers of America, I went down to the Ag Summit that G.T. Thompson had last August, and there were Future Farmers of America students there. And there was one from Erie County, so I connected with her. And um, so it's great to know that there's, you know, these kids are coming up. Now her story was she, didn't, she was not a farm girl, but she went and did part-time work on a dairy. So that's how she got interested. But Future Farmers of America is more of a leadership. They're teaching leadership skills. And it's not what it used to be back in the day with, okay, you're, you're gonna take over the family farm, this, that, and the other. Um, again, all fine and well, but my hope is that we can get more kids interested. As family farms have gone by the wayside, you've got kids that are removed from what it's like to live on a farm to even spend any time on a farm so there's a real opportunity to get these kids that are now either whether they're rural or if they're city if they don't have access to a farm let's get them on the farm doing something that's farm related and let's get them out there doing things as early as we can because if you don't again the formative years if you don't get them doing stuff you know playing with toys books in the library I donated a book to the library because what books on agriculture? Who, who here is gonna tell their child to go into agriculture? <laughs> Not a hand, right? So we need to turn that around. And again, my own, seeing it in my own experience, the loss in the value of hard work. Okay, I know it's hard to teach when kids are coming up, um, but there's nothing like that real experience of having, being out, open land, figuring it out for yourself, problem solving, having a task, being task oriented and getting that done no matter what it takes. And it's that pride, that ownership of I did that. This is a reflection of me. So on to hopefully the good news. So promising trends, I, you know, it was, I was changing jobs and I took a week off and I came here Literally the week was March 20th or March 23rd. 
March 23rd was the date, Monday. And so this is 2020 and with the pandemic and my, what I wanted to do with that time is to really write down what I wanted to do with the farm and start networking with people. And so here we are, never could have imagined. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm back at the family farm, I'm safe. <laughs> I'm safe from the city, I'm safe from COVID, that kind of thing. Never could have imagined what the pandemic held, would hold for us over, and we're, we just, the public health emergency just ended. So the silver lining of that was that people started to wake up in terms of where their food was coming from. Um, uh, how many people had fun searching for food in the grocery store? You know, store shelves were empty. And so lots of people turned to backyard. Of, gardens were huge. A lot of people are interested in having chicken flocks in their backyards. Um, you know, we, people will ask my sister about her chickens and I, you know, I think it would be great if we could kind of have a little um, education session because they're not that difficult to maintain, but no one takes care of chickens like Diane does, so. <laughs> okay, promising trends, agritourism. So this is something that's been around uh, for probably the past 10 years, and it's been growing. The extension system does a great job. Um, uh, we. Uh, Penn State is involved with this. Vermont is really, in my opinion, the leader in doing agritourism research. This diagram happens to be from Oregon State University. But looking at farms in a different light. So when you start in that uh, upper left quadrant, or well, whatever five is, divided by five, that upper left pie, education. So all the different things that you can do on a farm that's education related ag fairs, ag museums off the farm, classes, tours, dinner, tastings. Then you come in clockwise direct sales. So you're seeing you know, more people selling from their farm to people. Uh, we're, we're doing the farmer's market thing, but again, we can get people on the farm purchasing. There are ways to do that. They're direct to consumer market than entertainment. So we've got a lot of corn mazes, uh, uh, fall festivals, um, doing different, you see people having hosting weddings on farms, uh, doing art and photography on the farm, concerts on the farm, then going down out uh, toward the, the left, outdoor recreation, classes and tours, horseback riding, hiking, fishing and hunting, wildlife viewing, and then finishing out hospitality so back to where we're having like on-farm dinners uh, people staying on the farm yeah that kind of thing so looking at the farm in a in a more holistic way slightly different lens than what you would traditionally think of and one of the what's the biggest barrier to having a people on your farm which you, why wouldn't you want people walking on your farm so in 2021, that's why I kind of think the stars are aligned, PA uh, passed the Agritourism Activity Protection Act. And so it doesn't mean that it's a free for all, that you know, a farmer is completely not liable, but it would have to be really egregious negligence in terms of the farm condition, et cetera, and what they were having people on the farm for. But this allows um, farmers to host events on the farm and minimizes the anxiety around people suing the farmer and, you know, again, everything that they worked for. I mentioned for folks that were here early, I've got some uh, materials on Rodale. I learned about Rodale from a work colleague. And so it's the Rodale Institute. It's in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. Rodale is considered the, I have heard, the father of permaculture. Um, they're no longer really calling it permaculture. It's orga regenerative organic agriculture. So with all that's happening in our world today, the idea is that we're using sustainable, turning to sustainable agricultural practices that feed the soil, 
so you get a better product, whether you're growing a, a crop or if you're raising animals on that land, grazing animals, um, you're going to have a healthier product. And then, obviously, you consume it and you're, uh, you know, we get the full cycle. Healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. Uh, climate change, there's a huge push for carbon sequestration, but there's still a lot of questions around that. Again, in my research, I did reach out to a company that was promoting, okay, well, we'll pay you X number of dollars to keep an, a certain amount of acreage in timber so that the trees can sequester the carbon in the soil. But for people like us, that is not gonna be enough money to maintain the taxes on the farm and everything that you've gotta to do to keep a farm running. So they've got a long way to work it out. What I'd love to, to see is a tool. So if I plant X tree or X shrub, something that's gonna be around for a while, what's the estimated carbon we would sequester with that? tree. It's coming. I don't know that there are tools that are approved for use yet. Another promising trend is we think that people aren't, young people especially, are not interested in agriculture and it's not true. We've got people from all over the world that want to have farm experiences and will pay to work on a farm. You just have to have a farm that's ready to accept these people. Um, so we actually have three around us, generally around us, here we are. There's a farm over in, um, I want to say it's Ashtabula, Ohio, but it's this chestnut farm, blueberry farm. And then there's one down here, just above I-80, and then another up here near Dunkirk. So there are people all over the world, young people looking for experiences on um, organic farm so they come and work for a month or, or two months and they pay to come work on the farm to get that experience so I think that's a win-win situation also women in agriculture USDA has a lot of resources um, for women and other groups that have traditionally not had access to agriculture Okay, or to land and et cetera. But more and more you're, you're seeing women. And I say this to say, you know, it is a little bit of a, um, I wanna say burr in my saddle a bit because women have always been on farms. They just weren't the farmer of record. My mom worked right alongside my dad. She wanted the farm and she worked right alongside him whatever was going on with the cows, cleaning out the milk house, um, straining the milk, doing those kind of things. So it really, they, they were always there, but there's growing recognition of women as they lead on the farms. So um, you'll see all kinds of, especially on Facebook, there are all kinds of uh, female women farmer um, activity going on, so I think that's great. Also veteran farmers, so uh, as I was showing earlier with the, you know, the suicide aspect, the farmer stress, well on the other side, because we need farmers, there are actually bridge programs for veteran farmers. The Department of Defense will actually, if when they, uh, there's a troop or an airman or what have you that is, is going to um, retire from the military, there are actually programs to help them bridge into agriculture where they can go work on a sort of, uh, I guess I want to say, I would say certified, but basically it has to be an approved farm that they're going to learn how to farm. And so that bridges them over into hopefully uh, owning their own farm, get at least getting a, a start. But there are a number, especially in Pennsylvania, we've got troops to tractors, they're a big connector um, for veteran programs. Um, this NCAT, the National Center for, I'm not sure what the A stands for, but it's technology. They have this program called Arm to Farm. I believe they're out in, they're in the Northwest somewhere, but they actually have a Carlisle, PA location I was surprised to see. So again, giving uh, veterans an opportunity to work on a farm, see if they like it, actually get that education uh, and training 
Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Also, I wanted to mention locally, we have the Bodhi Garden Initiative. Have, has, has anyone heard about that? So it's up in Erie, and um, a colleague of ours is involved with that, and it's turning, I believe it's an old metro, metro transit station into an indoor farm, so indoor agriculture. And the idea would be that it's not just for veterans, but veterans would come and work there for, from a, for a stress management type of experience. So I mentioned that we're losing youth in these programs, FFA and, and 4-H are kind of waning in this area, but they're still around. And I was surprised to hear that Clymer actually restarted the Future Farmers of America program there. So that's, that's wonderful. That's a nearby resource. Um, again, I would love to see it one day where Corey actually has that back in action. But building on what already exists. And farm to school, there's a national farm to school network. Pennsylvania has its own chapter. So that was kind of, I mean, I would love to be, I'd love to put our pin on that map for Corey PA, uh, for a uh, you know, farm to school program. There's a Pennsylvania Young Farmers Association. We've got the National Young Farmers Coalition. So it takes making these connections, explaining what our region has to offer and getting these people here and experiencing it so that they can see firsthand. You know, th this place, Northwest PA has opportunity um, I wanted to mention our friends at the, uh, with the Erie Food Policy Advisory Council. Um, we have a couple of, <clears throat> for Three Pillars Farm, we have a couple of board members that have been engaged with this. And they actually had a food summit January 2023, and it was talking about several s similar things. So how do we have a resilient food system in Northwest PA, one we can count on when we need it? And so it was a discussion. It was sort of that opening dialogue about what the issues are and where the gaps are and potentially who can help fill them. And if we don't have who can fill them, then how do we get the people that can help fill them? And so, you know, one of the areas that's really talked about a lot, can anybody guess what our biggest issue is for food? The food system here? How do we get meat processed? And, and have it safely. We've got Dan Stroop with his beautiful Piedmontese cattle on our property, but how do we get Dan's beautiful Piedmontese beef processed and to you on your plate and do it efficiently and safely? That's what we have challenge. Um, there's Sugar Grove has Caferos, if I'm saying that correctly, and they do a great job, but they can only process so much. Anybody know the length of time it takes to get a, a cow processed? How far ahead in advance would you have to get a cow on a list? A year. So you've got to plan way ahead. Okay, and, and people are doing this, and, and again, I haven't explored everything. I know Dan's experience. Uh, I know we have other beef cattle farmers in this area, but Somebody needs to talk to them and understand what their issues are. And then somebody needs to take that data and bring it to people who might be able to do something about it and help, you know, coalesce. Let's get the coalition of the willing together because we need processing. Now, one of the things I will say, Penn State now has a butchering program. They, I think they're, I want to say they're like 10 spots. They had 80 people sign up for this. So there's interest and, and, and there's hope, but we've got to connect with State College. Um, when I went down there last August, I was disappointed that there weren't many people from Northwest PA, and why should I be disappointed? I know this. But they don't think about us if we don't represent ourselves, if we're not there at the table and talking about the problems. So we've got to get on their radar. And I did talk to Secretary Redding. I did talk to Penn State Dean of Agriculture. Um, I also wanted to know why there was not one female on the stage uh, for agriculture. So I'm hoping we can change 
the future. We've got to get youngins engaged any way possible and, and hopefully, you know, give voice to our region and be the future of farming for Northwest PA. But uh, another great thing, two great things, Meadville Market, anybody been over there? They got it going on, historical building. And again, I, I went, tried to go there, it was after hours. I drive back and forth to Georgia a lot. And so by the time I get up here, uh, this place is typically closed, but I haven't had a chance to go see what they have, but I see good things about it on Facebook. So, you know, building on the awareness, what's already working well. I see Port Farms is doing great. They've got an agritourism, they've used their farm for agritourism in addition to traditional farming, um, but they're doing all kinds of programs there. So, and apparently people are loving it. Uh, Corey, you, is everyone from Corey? Got a couple people. Okay, well Corey's got it, in my opinion. I see some really good things going on. Um, what impact Corey is doing to bring rural economic dollars here to build off of what was, you know, the history of the region for the railroad. We need something to bring people here. And so again, with, this, with new folks moving to this area, because of what, what the development is doing, um, then hopefully we'll open some eyes of the youngins that are moving in with the people that are moving to our area. The other thing, not, you know, this year was kind of an anomaly, but the past few years, every year in the summer, what's happening out west? wildfires 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 and so you know you'll see not only where it's taking houses but it's impacting farms so we've got water so with erie the great lakes we personally have more water than we know what to do with on the farm we got to figure out that's an engineering problem we got to figure out but we've got water and with the changing in the climate, we are seeing when it storms, we've got water coming down from Bear Lake. Uh, we've got the, the hilly area. We get it in Pine Valley Creek and it just brings everything with it. So the fields get flooded. So now we can't plant all the way to the end of the field near the creek. We have to come in to protect crops. How can we harness this water? flies in and it does what it's going to do, how can we better harness it and, and manage it so that we can hold it and then use it to water the animals, water the crops, etc. cetera. Um, also, hopefully the broadband initiative. Um, I know that Impact Corey has a plan. Uh, we are in Warren County, so we have to work with our uh, county officials there. I'm hoping and praying we get broadband because I try to bring people up from Atlanta to enjoy the area and see what it has to offer because it has a lot to offer, the, all the outdoor activity. But I need broadband so that they can work up here. So, regional tourism. I'm happy to say that, you know, we fit into the Pennsylvania wilds right up in that corner where the number one is. Um, we're also five minutes off of Route 6, so the uh, Pennsylvania Route 6 Alliance, and then also Visit Erie. So we have all these tourism groups, organizations that promote the area and help bring people here. So if we can get you know, the farm idea going, kids, 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 kids will remember. We have to make memories on the farm because they'll always remember that, and hopefully something will spark down the, down the line. So while we have a lot of resources, there are a lot of programs, yes, becoming a farmer is still very challenging. Land access is the biggest barrier. Land is only increasing in cost. And so being able to buy your first 10 acres, what have you, normal banks aren't touching that. Um, you have to go through USDA or find someone that's willing to provide that money to get 
these young folks access to land. The complexity of the systems. I work with grants and when I try to navigate all that USDA has to offer, my head spins. <laughs> so <laughs> the system is very complex and there are a myriad of entities, not just USDA, there are other entities out there. Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, um, the Sustainable Agriculture Research, SARE, I forget what the E stands for, but they give grants, but navigating those systems, figuring out how you're gonna piece it together, that's, that's a challenge, and you're trying to raise a family, et cetera, so the systems are really complex and daunting. Having the time to do it, okay? People are working, if they're working one job, potentially could be working another, just trying to make ends meet. So having the time, maybe it's a dream to have a farm, but having the time to really get into this and dedicate it, that's a challenge. The ability to connect with resources. You may not catch that agent when you need to catch that agent. You may call and leave a message. You may email, but they may not get back with you. So it is a challenge. You have to be persistent to connect with those resources. And then the lack of mentorship. If, we, if someone thinks they want to farm, they really do need someone there to kind of say, hey, don't do it this way, try it that way, or you know, this tends to work a little better. So my hope is that we can kind of address some of these issues with Three Pillars Farm. So a little bit about Pine Valley in Warren County. So I had no idea. Again, it takes coming back and, and hearing from people, but one of the local farmers shared this clip. It's from an old Sunday paper. So I had no idea that Pine Valley was famous for its tall trees and that people came from the East Coast to cut down the pines to ship them back for masts, for sale, uh, for ships. So kind of feels good to be have a little part of history there. We don't have as many pines as we used to unfortunately. More hardwood. My uncle shared this picture with me. I'm not sure where he got it and I'm not sure what the date is. But this is Pine Valley. I'm going to do a and that that marker that's where Freehold Township begins. So this is the railroad that comes from Columbus and runs into Bear Lake. And then this is Pine Valley Road, which this, this is the underpass that um, where it used to run. This is old Pine Valley Road. My aunt lives there. Our farm is here. This is Pine Valley Creek. So our farm is here. My grandfather bought this farm and land in this valley. But what I was astounded to see is look at how many dots are in this valley. So um, I interviewed Iola Benick a couple years ago, and her mother and, and grandparents had a house right here, um, Skolton. I think it was Skolton. And um, so to hear her tell her story, she turned 100 last year, and to hear Iola tell her story of when my grandparents came and bought that farm, my mom was not yet born. And what she said is that her mom told her, I think she was like six, seven, eight maybe, her mom told her that um, my grandmother Lillian was pregnant and so Again, this is a cute story. She said she waited, she looked out the window and she waited and waited and waited by the window to see the stork come to deliver my mom. So again, having, again, a hundred, this woman is 100 years old and having that history. Now her family, her father died when she was little. I, and I, I'm guessing, she said he died of pneumonia, but I'm guessing it could have been related to the 1918 pandemic. Um, but her mom had to survive, had to take care of her and survive. So she started raising chickens. And so there were old chicken houses there. And she talks about putting, um, they would go to Bear Lake, put the eggs on the train to be shipped up to Jamestown. 
So this, and she talks about how they would get together, they'd help each other with their farms. Apparently there was an orchard in Pine Valley and they'd pick apples, you know, together. So again, that, that community that used to be, and just, it blew my mind to see so many dots of so many houses there. There's Pine Valley Cemetery, that's on the other side of the tracks. Now, I don't want to trip here. It's probably around here somewhere. But there are Civil War veterans in that cemetery. So uh, this is the house that my grandfather bought. Uh, so it was the Nichols home. And, and when I was uh, back here a couple years ago, we went to the Cory Museum, and we were looking up um, snippets on Pine Valley. And so there was literally, I took a picture of the snippet. Uh, Mr. Nichols and his wife are moving to the country and they're putting their belongings on a train and they're gonna move out, you know, for the quiet life in the country out of Cory. So I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. But this is the house back in the day. Um, and apparently at one time, it was built in the 1850s. We have a, a, a stone marker but apparently at one time it was like a hotel, like a, a, a place to stay along the way. The, when we were growing up, there was a um, granite hitching post out front for people to tie their horses to. So unfortunately, it doesn't stand any longer. My brother, we bought that land and my brother wanted farmland, so he burned it down. And uh, again, I was nine, so no thinking knowing that that was a huge mistake, um, had no clue. So this, my al grandfather Alex um, bought the farm. This is my grandmother Lillian with my mom in the baby buggy, 1930. And then there's Lillian feeding the chickens. Uh, you would not catch me in heels and a dress and hose on the farm. But that's what you did back in the 1930s. And poor Lillian was a city girl. And so you can see how happy she was to be in the country uh, with three kids. <laughs> and so uh, an old picture of an old silo and the barn. And clearly they did um, renovate over the years. This is, I, you know, we're digging through my mom's stuff and, um, you know, finding uh, receipts and, and from my grandfather's you know dairy business so this is these are a couple of receipts from the Bear Lake um, dairy there used to be a milk processing plant in Bear Lake so if you know where the Bear Lake Inn is that building across from there that's now lumber they do lumber it used to be a, a milk processing place and my dad worked there my mom would talk about my grandfather taking uh, cartons of milk on a sleigh in the wintertime and running it up to Bear Lake to be processed. Iola talked about, well, once they milked, so back in the day, how did you keep the milk cold? So they would put it in the stream, uh, cool springs, to keep the milk cold. So this gives you an idea, you know, of back in the day what they, the milk prices were. So $1.88 per 100 pounds for milk. I uh, also found a 1944 tax form where he paid seven dollars. Uh, so again, making uh, 802 dollars worth of profit. Got six kids here. Yeah, six kids listed. My uncle Tom had gone off to um, serve in the in World War II by that time. So you see one boy and all the rest girls. Uh, so that's mom, dad, and John in our heyday. <clears throat> but, you know, takes a lot of work for a farm. So John was a uh, one man show, but he worked really hard and did very well for a time. So looking at the farm, I always judge it by looking at the pasture. <clears throat> hillside. So, you know, you see the Sadowski barn with silos. That, I'm sure that's one of my mom's horses. And then flipping around, looking from the pasture down. So this is that barn. So the house is no longer there, but the barn still remains. 
This is about 1995. Uh, John had built it up, so we had two silos. And you know, the indicator back in the day was how many barns did you have, how many silos did you have uh, to prove how um, successful a farmer you were in terms of you know, also with how many cows you were milking. So here he's building this heifer barn that we still have. It's still our best barn. Um, got wagons in the field. Now, you know, uh, you've got see farmers on the road. They're driving large trucks to haul manure. Just followed a manure truck back from Jamestown. <laughs> and, um, you know, hauling all the, the crops. So far left, that's my mom on her horse with the halter top that she loves so well, and my Aunt Eleanor. Look at that hillside. That's clean. You see a, a fence. So the Mr. West owned that farmland, so he had sheep. Then in the late 80s, looking again, that hillside's still pretty clean. Cows are still on the pasture. Now we've got goldenrod and multiflora rows to beat the band. And these are Dan Stroop's beautiful Piedmontese. I love those. I love the cow, and I can't, I can, I can take pictures of them all day. Um, but we've got to get animals on that land to turn it around. So here's our farm, 2020. That milk barn is no longer. The uh, winter snow uh, started caving in the roof, so we just went ahead and demolished it. So we're a work in progress, but we're a work, we're progressing. We're, we're not standing still. So with Three Pillars Farm, let me back up a second here. The Three Pillars is for the landmarks that are the silos, okay? So if folks are coming in from Route 6 in the back, you can see those silos. And so they serve as a good landmark. You know, they also are symbolic of the three of us who remain in the Zajac family. And then also, you know, the principles that I want to see um, espoused and, and implemented in our operations are that we communicate, we are collaborative, and we're compassionate. Because we're not going to get anywhere if we don't talk to people. Uh, we do not collaborate with people, and if we don't understand people. You have to understand where people are coming from in order to have that good relationship. So what I see is that we could enhance the quality of life for visitors to our area through whole person authentic experiences that feed the mind, body, and soul. Okay, what are kids doing these days? What have they been doing the, for the past decade? Cell phones, Game Boys, everything, it's here. The world is here instead of, I brought five teenage boys in the pan, during the summer 2020 in the pandemic up to the farm. They did not know what to do with open space. They're city boys, and that's just sad. Go explore in the woods. Nope, they're just on their phones. So um, you, we have to structure these experiences for young people and, and have them have those authentic experiences where they're connecting with each other. Um, also enhance the educational and economic opportunity for local communities in our area. And then ideally, I would love to work with the local university so that we document what we do, we write up what we do, we publish what we do so that other areas, we teach other areas what we're doing. Um, this is my son, Ben, when he was eight and really cute and moldable. Now he's 16 and not so moldable. My nephew, David, he was a good, uh, he was a good, good guy that come up here and help us with the farm. And then we also had an intern for the summer and they're doing trellising tomato plants. But I'd love to be able to do, uh, as we design things, keeping people with disabilities in mind. Um, you know, mom loved to be outside, but she could not move in her later years. And it just was so hard on her just to have to sit inside. So can we do things where we get people outside and regardless of your ability, physical or intellectual abilities, you're out there doing something that gives you purpose. 
And then with our silos, this is a picture of um, grain silos in Australia, I believe. I would love it if we could get um, an artist, commission an artist to do um, paintings of, on the silos like reflective of our area. The concept, the farm incubator, uh, so we have four good acres around the house. We've got barns, we've got equipment, we've got a high tunnel, um, we've got space. So the idea is to, there are farm incubator models, which I'll show you later, but give new farmers a place to test their plan, work with others, collaborate with others. So it's a community, you're not alone. and hone their farming skills so that they could then hopefully take it to the next level. Because if you want to be a farmer, you got to know what you're doing before you just go invest in property and equipment, et cetera. Um, anybody watch that Prime video, Carl's, Carlton's Farm, Carlson's Farm? Oh, okay, this guy from the UK who's wealthy and he goes out and buys all kinds, he wants to be a farmer, decides he wants to be a farmer. So he's making all kinds of mistakes and it's quite entertaining. A lot of people have talked about that. Um, doesn't know which tractor to buy, buys a tractor that's way too big to fit in his barn, but he likes it because it's big. So, um, and then hosting the visitors on site. So farm tours, I really want to get the local, you know, kids out here with Cory School System, Warren County System, Erie System, YMCA, 4-H, kids that don't, are, that are not on farms, can we give them a place to participate? They can have their animal on the farm and if they want to be in 4-H, have them have their animal at our place and we help sponsor them for 4-H. Overnight stays on the farm, we're put, putting in a couple of glamping sites but we want to build there so people can, can actually stay on the farm and enjoy not just the farm but what the region has to offer. And then also wellness and mental health retreats. Talking to gentlemen in Pittsburgh area do, uh, managing a grant with through the University of Pittsburgh for veteran um, mental health. And so he has, he's responsible for Western Pennsylvania. And so he actually emailed me today and said he's talking to somebody at the Warren YMCA tomorrow. But can we get veterans out to do purposeful activities on the farm? Cutting trails, building projects, um, things that help them, they're working together as a team, they're out there, they're, they, they're not alone, if they feel like talking about something, they talk about it, if they don't, they don't, they just have that com camaraderie and, you know, help with uh, mental health issues. And as I mentioned, collaborate with the local and regional partners to complement what is already being done that, you know, people are doing so well. So we've had a couple of toe in the water events and I'll get moving because I know we don't have much time. Um, we had the Cory Blue Zones were a godsend in my mind because they connected me with so many people. And it's all those nine principles. Well, a lot of them align to the farm environment. So we did a class with uh, Laura Ayers from the National Resources Conservation Service on food sourcing. So it was you know, really enlightening to me to for and I think for the class to see how far their food travels to get um, to the grocery store and then we did a little hike around the farm and the kids enjoyed the chickens and we had uh, a young woman who let us borrow her goats um, and so that was fun for folks to come up and see then last year was our big blowout event farm fest 2022 I was thrilled we had 230 people come out and we had educational classes, we had a farrier come out, we even had the local Amish family up, had their, family, uh, uh, their horse shod. We had Melissa and her husband, Lion and her husband Aaron with the horse-drawn wagon rides, uh, Libby with her goats. That bottom left, I got city kids to muck out the barn, so that was an accomplishment in my book. Oops, I'm going backwards, go this way. So very quickly, there, as I said, I, when I travel, I'm trying to see what other people are doing. So these first two are probably my most, are the, like the foundation for the inspiration. This is Serenby, uh, it's in Palmetto, Georgia, which is southwest of Atlanta. And this wealthy restaurant tour takes a 300-year-old farm, 
turns it into this 1200 acre community where people buy houses and it's sort of this is their environment. I do not want to do that. What I want to take is the in farm to table restaurant, have an organic farm with community supported agriculture, do all these different activities on there where we have an art, culture, uh, we did goat yoga last year on the, for Farm Fest, so these things are doable. This is probably the closest to what I want to do, is Shelburne Farms in Shelburne, Vermont. They're on Lake Champlain. They have an, a working dairy. They, you can go stay there if you want to just stay, but people, they train teachers in sustainable um, agriculture practices to take back to their classrooms. So they, they they're a terrific model. A friend of mine let, uh, shared with me uh, about this organization, Watch Us Farm, that works with people with disability. So they do farm-related activities and work in the community to give them purpose and, and improve their quality of life. We have a couple of Pennsylvania um, examples of farm camps. I'd love to do a farm camp. That's probably a not too far down the road where we get kids out on the farm staying for a week at a time. And then we've got uh, the LEAF Le Leadership Education and Farming group. And both of these are in central Pennsylvania. And I mentioned about farm incubators. So you've got Farm Core. Again, they train people to be farmers. It's a cup, you know, two year programs um, where they have that formal curriculum. So there are models out there, that's my point. Um, I'll run through this very quickly. So the first phase is where we are now. Get the farm incubator established, clean up the farm. I'd love to start a farm market to feature the best of what's locally grown in the region um, and get a couple of places where people can come stay on the farm camping sites. Place making, we've got to do some work on the barns, um, kind of move that around like the uh, chessboard and then build a couple of places for people to stay um, for an ex extended period of time. If that works then I would love to go big and have a beautiful barn where we do events you can whether it's educational, social, what have you and then rebuild my parents grand uh, my grandparents farmhouse from long ago and far away. So we have a star in the audience, Betsy Grinder. She's our first farmer. Um, this is our new website, courtesy of uh, Chelsea Oliver. So threepillarsfarm.org. Uh, I've got some board members here. We actually filed, I've got our nonprofit on file. We're doing all the administrative work for that. So we actually have a board of 10, which I'm thrilled about. Um, so. Uh, this is it's the site we still have a little tweaking to do, but bottom line, it's live. So if you want to kind of see what we're doing. So acknowledgement and thanks. Thanks to my grandparents for being brave and coming to um, Pine Valley, Pennsylvania, the Zajac family. Uh, Laura Ayers with the Warren County USDA Nat uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. She was the first person I started talking to and bouncing ideas off of. and. You know, she helped me navigate the terrain. And Penn State, I think they're underappreciated. You've got extension agents that have a wealth of um, knowledge that can help you across a lot of dimensions. So please use your pen. If you don't use them, we won't have them. So please reach out to them. There's an array of things that they do for the community. Corey Blue Zones, as I already mentioned, Impact Corey, Chuck Gray. Again, in Small Business Development Center during the pandemic, I was, again, the silver lining was that I was able to connect with people virtually. So I did all kinds of webinars through the Small Business Development Center. The SCORE program, um, which is a national program, is how I found Hoop, um, who has helped me tremendously. And it's a, it's a mentorship program for entrepreneurs. Strategy Solutions the team out of Erie that has helped me connect with a lot of people and helped me really develop the business plan, do market research. Um, Adam, who's made many a trip out to the farm uh, so that we can do a site plan on what could be for Three Pillars. I mentioned Chelsea for our website and other marketing communications. 
Betsy with your daily serving. We have our second farmer, Stacy Samuels, who's a flower farmer. So her business name is a chicken, her garden. So fresh flowers for all your events. And then the, our Three Pillars Farm Board of Directors. We have Julian McRae here, so thank you. Hoop Roach, Betsy Grinder. I don't think I'm missing anybody. So I think that's it. Um, we won't do the, the tech, but question to you is, what are we losing if we don't turn family farming around? I know it's late. We're, in my opinion, we're losing a way of life. And we need to do, you know, uh, I'm going to do what I can do to turn it around. So come see us. So uh, with that, I will, uh, there are some resources here uh, for folks for land access. One of the things I think would be terrific is I know there are nonprofits on the East Coast and West Coast that actually um, provide funding for uh, new farmers to actually get land. And I would love it if we could do something like that here so that we make it easier, knock down some of these barriers for young people because the land will be there. And if we don't hook up current farmers with farmers that want to be, bridge that gap, we've got land sitting there. And it's, you know, we want to make good use of that land. So thank you for listening.